Eagles Entertainment. The journey of the draft is driven by AAA. AAA roadside is their strong side. Make AAA a part of your game day today. AAA, go ahead. With the 25th pick in the NFL draft, the Philadelphia Eagles select. You're listening to the Journey to the Draft podcast, driven by AAA. Welcome to the Journey of the Draft podcast, driven by AAA. I'm your host, Fran Duffy, and the NFL draft order is now set. As Super Bowl 55 is now in the past, the Chiefs pick 31, the Bucks pick 32, and with everyone now in draft season, we are excited to keep our NFL draft talk going here on the show. We're going to kick things off with Draft Buzz, where Ben Fennel and Dane Brugler and I reflect on some big news and perhaps the top player in this draft. And Really, if that means anything at all, going into April's draft, we'll hit on that at the very top of the show. But afterwards, we're going to get into players we've studied recently and start our position preview series. What's on deck today? Well, we are going to talk all about the running back position. So we'll hit on some of the top players at running back, how they compare to each other, kind of go through some superlatives, and how these guys all will make their transition to the NFL. I hope you all enjoy that segment. We're going to do it every single week here on the podcast. Next up, we head to On the Clock, and this segment was received with a lot of high fanfare last week. Dane, Ben, and I are assigned three random teams, three random positions, and three random parts of the draft. We're going to try and find a match. Valentine's Day coming up. Let's play a little matchmaker. That's going to be a fun weekly segment here on the show. And speaking of finding matches in the draft, the blueprint is now going to be in this early week episode. This is a segment that typically had been on our Thursday episodes over the last month or so, but we have kind of shifted some things around, and now this segment will appear in all of our Tuesday episodes moving forward. The reason for that is that Greg Cosell will now be on our show every single Thursday here throughout uh, the rest of this draft season leading up to April's draft. So with Greg taking into that spot on Thursday, we slid the blueprint here into Tuesday, and this week's guest a great one. Arif Hassan, who covers the Minnesota Vikings for the Athletic. Look, if you're doing a mock draft and you get to the Minnesota Vikings pick, I promise you, you do not want to miss the insight that Arif provides here on the Vikings thought process and their draft philosophy. So stay tuned for that towards the end of the show. Then we wrap things up with draft mailbag. We hit on a couple comments from you at home. And with that said, that means I've cleared out the queue. The door is now wide open for you to jump on to Apple Podcasts. Just a quick reminder, it does a great favor for us. Just consider it a personal favor for me. You go on, you leave a rating, you leave a comment, whether it's a question about draft process and the process of selecting a player, which we will hit on today in today's draft mailbag, or just a question about a specific player, a mock draft, position rankings, really whatever you want, because this is all about you. Head on over to Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, really wherever you listen to the podcast. Leave us that rating. Leave us that comment. That being said, let's get this show going. We've got some news to get to. We're talking running backs right at the top in Draft Buzz. Now it's time for Draft Buzz. All right, well, let's get this show started now with Draft Buzz. And uh, I would say the biggest news over the weekend outside of the draft order being finalized, as I alluded to earlier, uh, would be one that was kind of announced late Friday. And that's that Clemson quarterback Trevor Lawrence is going to have surgery on his non-throwing shoulder. He will still throw for teams, but it's going to be later this week. It'll be on February 12th, uh, which is obviously before Clemson's pro day. So uh, that way he can have the surgery as soon as possible and then be ready for camp. Uh, Dane, uh, any is there any way that this impacts how teams think at the top of this draft? No. And I'm, I'm curious, is this going to be virtual? Because as far as I, or my understanding was there were no uh, like workouts allowed, you know, only pro days. That's the only place where NFL teams are going to be able to watch these players. So oh, this might be hundred percent virtual. I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see how they work through that. Uh, but I understand why, you know, Trevor's doing it is to get something cleaned up. So just throw it, get out of the way. Um, I, you know, it, it's, his non-throwing shoulder, yep. it, you know, if somehow, some way the Jaguars throw us a, a curveball and they do something else at number one, it's not going to be because of this injury. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't think this will have any bearing on, uh, ultimately where, what happens at number one. Ben, any kind of feeling at, at all on this or should we just keep moving? Cause I, I agree with Dan. No, just kind of keep it moving. I'm sure he had his, you know, body poked and prod in the off season. There's going to be some, some yep. dings, some scratches, some fractures here and there, some serious, some not serious, and just something to get cleaned up in the off season. I'm sure he's might have had some minor procedures before. Sounds pretty minor. It's a pretty routine thing to get done in the February, March type of landscape in the off seasons. And I hope he's fully healthy and uh, ready to go for next season. 
So we're going to talk through the running back position at the end of this discussion, but just a couple questions I had for you guys uh, just to keep people uh, afloat as to what we're doing uh, on a daily basis here. Let's go with our film room recap and just a list a guy that we've watched over the last week that we want to kind of bring to the table. And, you know, every year there are a handful of juniors for me that kind of slip through the cracks, right? I, I don't watch them uh, in the summer leading into their junior year. Uh, obviously don't watch them during the season. If I'm watching players, I'm typically watching seniors getting ready for the senior bowl. We get through senior bowl week, and now I dive into a couple of these underclassmen that I had not been able to get to. One guy at the top of that list, and the first guy I watched last Monday after the senior bowl, Aziz Ojolari, the pass rusher from Georgia. Dane, you've been singing his praises for a long time. Ben, I know that you've been a fan. I'll tell you what, guys, I was blown away from Ojolari, and not just from a pure, like, oh, man, like he's got all these physical tools. Look at him, Ben. Look at him turn the corner. Look at the first step. That, that stuff is certainly there, but what stands out to me is that number one for a guy that is you know listed in the two forties? He holds up very well against the run. He's not a liability uh, when you're looking at him trying to be a three down player in the run game. So right off the bat, that's thumbs up for me. But number two, he's got such a well defined plan of attack as a pass rusher. He has got a go to move that he uses often. And then he's got a lot of change-ups off of it. That go-to move for him is that long-arm technique. And then he's got a number of different change-ups off of it. So, you know, he might throw that inside arm and then go with a, a swim. He might throw the inside arm and then go slap rip. He might, he's got a couple different change-ups off that. So that way, you know, yeah, it's not this wide, expansive list of moves, but he's got that ability to win in a number of different ways, whether it's p- purely with speed or with technique. He'll win on the inside as well. I was really, really impressed with Aziz Ojolari. Uh, Dane, I know that you've been a big fan of his film as well. Yeah, I felt very alone having him as my top edge rusher in this draft. So I'm very, very glad you saw a lot of the similar things. You know, he, he doesn't have that elite size necessarily yep. that you look for in terms of height. And, you know, we'll find out exactly what his length is. But you're right. He plays very strong at the point of attack. He's very skilled at using that burst and bend, uh, you know, the dip and rip, uh, the cornering skills. Um, you know, and uh, he led the SEC in sacks this year. He led the he led the SEC in tackles for loss. He led the yep. SEC in forced fumbles. So it's not like it's just traits here. We're talking about a guy that was also productive. Um, I, I to me, I don't see how uh, you know he gets out of the top twenty. But I don't know. Maybe, maybe we like him more than some other other people do. But he just he looks all day like a top twenty pick. Yeah, and Ben, I know that you did a little bit of a study on him as well recently. Uh, both of us uh, really, really high uh, on what Ojolari brought to the table. Yeah, absolutely. And I think his profile and reputation is this first step speed rusher, you know, winning high side all the time. But how he does that is actually very technical. And I was really impressed as we watched some of it together, how he uses his hands, yep. how he can corner in combination, you know, with using that first step, the flexibility, but also a very technical skill set as well. And we were both kind of into how Philly was the point of attack against the runs, particularly bullying tight ends, which we love to see. Um, I like him exponentially more than Harold, Harold Landry that went in the second round, had a bit of a knee injury, similar types of players, but I think Ojolari is much more pro ready. Yeah, two, uh, two notes on him real quick. Uh, yeah. He, he's tore his ACL a senior year in high school. Right. So just making sure the knee's okay. That'll be, you know, just something that teams have to figure out. I mean, by the looks of in the last few years, the knee's okay, but just making sure. Um, and then he was also, you know, talk about, character and attitude, things like that. I've heard nothing but good things. Uh, he was the only freshman uh, in the Kirby smart era to be named a captain. Um, you know, there's a lot of things going for him behind the scenes as well. So just something else to keep in mind. Uh, watching one of the clips that I posted of him on Twitter was uh, this real violent uh, uh, cross shot move that really reminded me of Carl Lawson when he was coming out of Auburn. And I tagged Carl Lawson uh, in the tweet saying like, oh, he looks just like him. And Lawson said, now it's much better than mine. His footwork is way better. He looks like Chandler Jones here. And to me, that's like knowing Carl Lawson being like a, you know, a technician, a guy that works really, really hard at his craft to give that kind of praise to a young kid, a 20 year old pass rusher. uh, Really impressive. So uh, yeah, really, really love Ojo. This is a definitely a uh, big Aziz Ojolari podcast. Uh, that being said, let's get to our next one here. Uh, and uh, Dane, or, or no, Ben, I'll come to you next. Who, who, who was uh, your, a guy that you studied over the last week? 
So I'm watching this really interesting uh, safety prospect out of Syracuse. And the safety group is really interesting after these first couple. You got Trayvon Murray, you know, Richie Grant, Hufanga, Nazar Ladin, what we want to call Owusu Koromoa, Andre Sisko, fellow teammate in Syracuse. But Trill Williams is a really interesting safety that I think is going to end up being a top 10 safety when it's all said and done. This is a 6'2", 215-pound junior defensive back that was previously a corner. This is a long limb kid, showed up on Bruce Feldman's freak list over the summer for a 43440 17 reps of 225 40 inch vertical so he's got the height weight speed explosiveness absolute turnover machine four force fumbles four interceptions in his career somehow in combination with all those turnovers Andre Cisco also created for that defense but this is a slot slot safety kid with corner experience he plays really hard he's an exceptional athlete he's twitchy he's physical he really is a maybe a round or two later version of Hamza Nasruddin out of Florida State, just to give fans a profile of the type of player here. Now, listen, his instincts are very raw. He's not a great tackler, a little bit lost down the field, playing the ball at times. But I think putting this kid in the middle of your defense, you're just getting a really good physical football player, a long-limbed athlete that I think is you know still developing and still has his best football ahead of him. So a guy that a little bit behind the eight ball right now as far as buzz and his draft stock, only a junior, just declared a couple of weeks ago. But in combination with Melifanu, Andre Cisco, that Syracuse secondary, really, really interesting prospects. Dane, have you done uh, Trill Williams? I have, I have not done him yet, so I'm interested to get your thoughts. Yeah, he's interesting. I I, uh, I agree with a lot of what Ben said. Um, I didn't get overly excited about his tape uh, because he is still figuring things out, um, You know, working from different alignments. Um, he, he was – a little bit of a, an up and down tackler. There are times where he would drive downfield and make the open field stick. And then others where he struggled to, you know, uh, allow his feet to come to balance and make the, uh, make the finish and finish in, in space. And so a little up and down there. And then his instincts in, in coverage, I thought were a little up and down. So I, I there, there's a lot he has going for him. I gave him an early day three grade. So, you know, I don't think I'm too far off from where, where Ben sees him. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's an interesting tight end group or a safety group when you've got guys like, you know, Caden Stearns and, uh, you know, Sean Wade's probably somewhere in that, that, that mix. And it's just, yeah, it's an interesting group of safeties where we, we, it's going to take a little bit longer to just fully figure them out and have a good feel for, for what they're going to be at the next level. And Fran, it's not quite the Isaiah Simmons, Jeremy Chin discussion of last okay. year, but similar. I think it's more of a day two to three as opposed to last year was a Isaiah Simmons top 10 pick versus a day two player in Jeremy Chin. But I know the conversation around the draft, we love finding similar style of players later in the draft, whether it's a better value or whether maybe you just missed on a player you wanted for your team. Hey, there might be somebody similar later on. So mm -hmm. I think finding groups of these safeties and who are kind of similar is part of, you know, stacking your board. I like it. Uh, Dane, who was, uh, who was your guy? Uh, so a guy that I finally got around to finishing his report, um, uh, Paulson Adebo from Stanford corner who opted out. Um, so we didn't, haven't seen him this year. It's just a really, I know we've talked about him before our, uh, on the pod, but just a really interesting, you know, trajectory because he he was so good as a redshirt freshman, uh, led the FBS in passes defense. Then last year, very up and down, um, you know, missed the final three games due to injury. Had plenty of negative plays on his film, um, but you know, when I got done watching him, I just I came away more encouraged than I thought. Um, interesting, and, because you, I, I feel like you weren't super high on him coming into the no. year. I was not because his, his, his 2019 stuff just left a bad taste in my mouth. Um, you know, it was just, it, you know, the double move against Gabriel Davis right, or yeah. of the, the, the penalties and things like that. Um, and you know, missed tackles, um, you know, I could pull up a missed tackle. He had God, what, what, what tape was that? I don't know. It was just one of the most embarrassing tackle attempts I've seen from a corner this year. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it just, it's very up and down, but when you look at it, 34 passes defensed in 22 games eight interceptions over that span as well. The guy's got length and he's got better foot quickness than I think I gave him credit for. He's leggy. So, you know, he's upright and it looks a little stiff at times. He'll fall step, but he has really good foot quickness. And so the size, the foot agility and the instinctive ball skills, you give me those three traits and that's worth gambling on. Um, you know, I think he's, probably best as a press man guy where, you know, he doesn't have to, uh, 
you know, he, he doesn't have to worry about false stepping as much, uh, but he could also play cover three. So I, 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 I like, I think he's a top 100 guy. Um, again, when you have a guy that size and with the foot quickness that he has and the ball skills that he has, I just think that is worth gambling on. So I think he's going to make his way into the top 100. So two things for me on a day boat. Uh, number one, I do wonder how he's going to test here this spring because teammates have like raved about his, like his athleticism and how he times and stuff like that. So uh, talking with teammates over the last couple of years, going back to even his freshman year, uh, I am interested to see how he times. Cause I don't know that it'll quite match what we see on the film. That being said, the one thing that you brought up, uh, the thing that stood out me- most to me about him his uh, reaction quickness against routes, whether it was from man or zone, if he's uh, you know manned up on a guy and he's, he has a really good understanding of route breaks and being able to undercut throws and then from zone kind of reading concepts and understanding how offenses were looking to attack them and kind of beating the receiver to the ball. I thought that he would, that all led to a lot of the production that he had. And that's honestly, that's a trait that's really tough to coach into a guy. And so the fact that uh, I thought he was so per- proficient in that area uh, really kind of stood out to me. Um, all right. So, those are our three uh, film and recap guys. Let's get to uh, just some player comps before we get uh, to the uh, to the running back discussion here. Ben, uh, I'll let you kick things off. We're going to stick with linebackers, <clears throat> off-ball linebackers. If you could just name one guy uh, that you've watched that you have, feel pretty good about a player comp for. Well, one of the more intriguing overall players in this class is this Tulsa outside linebacker, Zayvon Collins, at 6'4", 260, playmaking, explosive athlete. I don't know if we want to call him a Mike, a Sam, a defensive end, an outside linebacker. He's a great football player. And there's some guys that he reminds me of. And I don't know if it's just the last name here, but going with Jamie Collins, you know, went some of his best football uh, with the New England Patriots and with the Cleveland Browns. I think he's back with the Patriots right now. He's with, the, with the, uh, Patri- Li- he's with the Lions now. The actually. Lions as well. Yeah. yeah, Matt Patricia. But similar type of player in that he's kind of awkward for his position. He's a jack of all trades type of skill set extremely athletic. Where do you play him at the next level? He's not going to be a fit for every scheme, but I think it's really easy to see uh, when they're both playing their best ball. Definitely similar styles of player here. Jamie Collins, Zavin Collins. I love that one. Uh, Dane, who's yours? So I went with Monty Rice, the Georgia linebacker. Okay. Comparing him to Micah Kaiser, uh, former UVA. Interesting. Uh, linebacker now with the Rams who is seeing starter reps. Um, I think there is a lot of similarities when you look at, they're just, they're gritty, tenacious guys, yeah. quick to diagnose, very aggressive downhill. They've got NFL level strength so they can battle through blocks. Um, you know, there are a lot of times where he needs to do a better job with his patience, his technique. There's some limitations in coverage, but as a downhill banger and a guy with that killer mentality, he's going to fill up the stat sheet. Uh, I think there's there's some similarities there. And in the right situation, I, I think he could be a starter just like Kaiser. I like that. And height, height, weight, speed, wingspan, arm length, all those similar prospects, just over six feet, just under 240. You didn't think Kaiser was going to be able to survive at the next level with his lack yep. of length without the foot speed, but he's a guy with really good instincts, a great tackler, technically sound kid. You definitely see that with Monty Rice. That's a yeah. great call. A lot of the same questions I have about Rice, I had about Kaiser. I, I think that matches uh, really well. For mine, uh, I'm going to go with Pete Werner, the linebacker from Ohio State. Uh, going back to when I studied Matt Milano when he was coming out of Boston College, Milano was kind of like that hybrid Sam linebacker. He'd rush off the edge. He play a lot in coverage. He played a lot in the slot. And I remember talking with some Boston College coaches at the time, and they kind of raved uh, about his versatility and how important he was to that defense. Even though the production wasn't always there, Milano slides kind of under, under the radar. He doesn't go to the senior bowl. He goes to the combine. Um, and I kind of view Werner in that same kind of light where, uh, Ben, I mean, I remember watching, you know, sitting next to you uh, as you were watching Ohio State film last in 2019 and you're just raving about the, you know, Pete Werner and how he allows them to stay in base cover, base defense against three receiver sets and, you know, watch him play the slot and turn and run with people. And, you know, I know the production hasn't always been there, but just how important he was to that scheme. I think Werner has a lot of those same traits. He'll need the right defense to really kind of tap into that versatility and fight. It's kind of like what you were saying about Zayvon Collins earlier, Ben. But I think when you look at Werner, if you're a team that puts a lot on your backers to be able to play in coverage, he's going to have a lot of value. He's a really athletic linebacker that I think is going to fit in today's style of, of NFL. Just a matter whether you think he's a Mike, a Will, a sub package player, more of an assignment matchup guy who he's had no problem erasing tight ends and some, you know, outside the numbers matchup stuff. So uh, definitely an athletic piece won't be a fit for everybody. And I think all three of these guys we're talking about coincidentally, all three linebackers mm-hmm. won't be for every scheme. 
right. but they're good players when used properly. All right, let's get to our uh, our running back discussion here. And basically what we're going to do is Every week, we'll pick a different position and just kind of highlight some names that people need to talk or need to know about uh, get, as we get closer to April's draft. We'll do it over the course of five categories. And our first one, we're just going to talk about the back with the best vision. And each of us will pick a back, but from different parts of the draft. So, Dane, you'll pick a guy from day one. I'll pick a guy that we're talking about day two, which is rounds two, round three. And, Ben, for this one, you'll take day three, so a guy from round four and on. Uh, Dane, which of the round one options, which I mean, we're only talking about a couple names here, impress you most just from a pure vision standpoint at the running back position? I think I'm probably going to lean Najee Harris here yep. um, <clears throat> over Travis Etienne. And, you know, over the years, I thought Harris's vision got better and better. And that really allowed his decision making as a runner to develop. And that's something that we saw really culminate as a senior. So Najee Harris gets my vote for uh, top vision among the day one guys. I like that. And I'm, I'm glad we're able to, with the one upside, I would say to having only two options for you to pick from is that you can kind of juxtapose those two guys next to each other and say, yeah, I yeah. kind of like Harris's vision just a little bit more. Uh, we'll continue talking about those two guys here later in the discussion for me, uh, going to day two, I want to go to a guy that we're not really talking about. He's been out of sight, out of mind. And that's Kenny Gainwell from Memphis. You know, I go back to, uh, when I watched him back in the summer, I really loved his patience in the zone run game. I thought that he showed a really good feel for allowing blocks to develop and, you know, kind of finding a crease, putting his foot in the ground and getting downhill. But then on their gap schemes where, uh, you know, he's got a puller out in front or he's just got, uh, you know, I've got to read this gap or that gap and go. I thought he was really decisive and I thought he did a nice job of setting up blocks both at the second level and then also at the third level out in space as well. So uh, I'm going with Kenny Gainwell, a guy that uh, I'm definitely high on. Uh, Ben, uh, who's yours for day three? Yeah, there are a couple here I was considering, whether it's Jarrett Patterson at Buffalo, who I feel like needs a little bit more buzz, Khalil Herbert. I thought had some good vision at Virginia Tech. But I'm going to go with another guy not getting a whole lot of buzz that I think is a day three back, and that's Jamar Jefferson Hmm. at Oregon State. That's right, a Pac-12 running back. I haven't been talking too much about those, but this is a heavy zone scheme, which you're going to probably need to really accentuate that vision, a lot of inside zone, mid zone stuff. He's an upright slasher. He's high cut. He's leggy, has really paid patient to the line of scrimmage and then darts through that line of scrimmage. Who does that remind us of very much like a Le'Veon Bell where you almost think it's too lackadaisical behind the line and then just accelerates through. And you can see that slashing movement through the line of scrimmage and then his ability to create in the open field. He's a really interesting running back 1300 yards in 2018 as a freshman on the scene there, not quite that production since then, but he's a guy that's averaged nearly six yards of carry in his career. And he's lumped together in this day three, you know, group of backs for me that he could end up being a fourth round pick. He could end up being an undrafted guy. Mm. I think these day three kind of skill players are really all over the place with different people's board, but Jamar Jefferson, when the ball is in, in his hands, He's a really good player. And I think he opened up 2020 with four straight 100-yard games. So right. he's a guy that seems to produce, you know, anytime he's uh, on the field. So just a matter of if you get your hands on that Oregon State tape. That's right. If, you, uh, if you're able to tell you, I remember he, you actually had brought him up, I think going back to 2019 uh, as well, talking about Jamar Jefferson. Um, let's go to the third down value. Next category here. Best, uh, best option on third down. I'll take the day one option. Ben, you've got day two. Daniel, round us out with day three. And again, when it comes to day one, we're really talking about Najee Harris versus Travis Etienne. And I'm going to be honest, guys, when we talk about third down, we're not just talking about pass catcher, but we're talking about as a blocker as well. And to me, when you talk about who's the most well-rounded, I'm going to take Najee Harris here. Not only are his hands outstanding, uh, but when you look at him as a blocker, I think he's definitely ahead of ETN uh, in that category as of this point. Um, but to me, I, I think Najee Harris, outside of not quite not being quite as dynamic, as explosive as ETN is, and you know he showed off his wares uh, as a pass catcher this year, much more improved in that area, much more productive in that area. I'll, I'll still take Najee Harris when you talk about the all-around game on third down as both a pass catcher and as a, uh, as a pass blocker as well. He has a great pick right there. On day two, I wanted to go Kenneth Gainwell. You just gave him a nod in the last segment. So I'm going to go Demetric Felton. And I know everybody's saying, whoa, 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 Felton. I thought he was a receiver now at the Senior Bowl. He lines up 85% in the backfield the last two seasons. What does that make him? A backfield player. He is a running back, but he's a pass-catching running back. And that's okay. 
So that's right what we're talking about here. He's a day two option that's going to accentuate somebody's third down offense in the NFL, just like Naheem Hines did at NC State doing for the Indianapolis Colts. Felton, receiver background, four-star coming out of high school, played receiver early on at UCLA. He's a running back right now, in my opinion. I think he's one of the darlings of the draft and will be a, uh, a lock day two pick, in my opinion. When we when we cover quarterbacks, Ben's gonna now. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Felton is a backfield guy. <laughs> he could line him up in the wildcat. He could play court. Uh, hear me out. Hear me. Don't out. limit him. Don't yeah. limit him. <laughs> Don't uh, put him in a box. Don't put him in a box. <laughs> yeah. So for day three, I went with uh, Elijah Mitchell, uh, Lafayette runner, uh, who I think he's got some of the best receiving skills uh, among the running back group in this class. Catches the ball like a wide receiver. Really good away from his body. Um, got a little bit after the catch with his because he runs str- uh, so strong. Um, I, I think that's going to be his bread and butter at the next level is you know what he can do in the passing game and what he can do on third down. So I don't know that he's going to be an every down player, but his, his role on third down is going to keep him in the league. Love it. All right, well, let's get to our next one here. Best between the tackles runner. So the guy we like uh, most on the inside. Uh, ben, you've got day one. Dane, you've got day two. I will round us out with day three. Ben, you can kick us off here. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I'm running out of day one running backs here because I only have <laughs> one on my board, and that's Najee Harris. But I uh, love his vision between the tackles, a lot of you know variety of schemes that Alabama offense, some zone stuff, a lot of gap man power stuff as well. He's a tall, upright runner. But this guy can lower his pads and short yardage and take on defenders through contact, falls forward, rarely fumbles, great vision between the tackles. He's a guy that can be that bell cow back for somebody. Really impressive player. I don't think I'm breaking any news there, but a guy we know what Alabama does with their offensive line. You need a running back to accentuate that between the tackles, physical run style. And Najee Harris certainly was uh, up to the task throughout his career at Bama. So real quick, Dane, before you go, uh, I mean, I feel like we have to kind of address this now. We've gone three categories. All three have gone in Sweet. favor of, of Harris. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? That's that's funny. I, and that's just kind of how it played out. Now, if if there was a, you know, a category for the best home run hitter, you know, like then that's sure. where ETN would get them. So it's, yeah, I, I think it is interesting though that that Harris, and I and I agree, um, you know, for when, when you guys went with Harris as well for those categories. So I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think that he's the clear cut number one back in this yep. this draft. I think plenty of teams will look at ETN and some of the you know the big play. It basically, what do you you know want the the better batting average, singles and doubles? Or you want the guy with the the home run power and, and the guy that's going to give you the big plays. So it's it's an interesting debate that I think you know teams will be split on. Yeah. Uh, Dane, who's your day two guy? I want the guy with the coolest bat flips. That's all I want. <laughs> Uh, so I went with uh, Javante Williams and, you know, it, this, there are times where he will bounce it outside when he should be running it up the middle. Um, but I, his ability to just be a violent runner is it just helps him so much as an inside guy. Uh, his balance, uh, he, he led the FBS in broken tackles with 47 last year. Uh, he routinely with his power, with his balance routinely bounces off contact. And so, you know, for a guy who, uh, is still kind of learning the, you know, how to, you know, make certain reads and, uh, you know, navigate run lanes, things like that. He's still learning, but, and that, that makes him an inconsistent decision maker at the line of scrimmage. But when he does commit to being an inside runner, uh, he is just a hard guy to get on the ground. He, he really forces defenders to be near perfect. Uh, to to really finish him to the ground. So just a fun player. Uh, we're going to talk about Javante Williams here in a little bit. Or I should say I am, so I don't want to uh, comment too much on it. I'll just go to right to my day three guy. And uh, I had a couple names written down here. I thought about going Ramondre Stevenson from Oklahoma, but ultimately I went with his uh, former teammate in Trey Sermon from Ohio State. Now, there's possible that Sermon does go with the latter stages of day two, but if he does fall to day three, I think you're looking at a guy who's a great downhill runner. He runs as hard as anybody in this class, uh, really violent with his ability to take on contact and play through contact. I love his ability to lower the shoulder, but also as a st- he's got the best stiff arm, I think, uh, in this class as well. Um, in terms of somebody that I want to kind of bang between the tackles, uh, Sermon uh, really, really kind of revs my engine a little bit here. Uh, ben, what do you think of this comp? Alexander Madison to Trey Sermon. What do you think overall uh, on that one? Because he was a name that I kind of came up with as uh, a player he reminded me of, especially watching all the zone runs with that Ohio State offense this year. You know, you watch him against Northwestern, and you're like, yeah, I got he kind of looks like Madison you know, playing in that Vikings, uh, Vikings system up there in Minnesota. 
Yeah, I saw a flash of Madison up at Boise, how physical of a runner he was as well. He's a guy that does the punishing to defenders, especially in the open field. So a guy that I I think any NFL kind of running back group would love to have that type of presence in the room. No doubt. I saw a little bit of T.J. Yeldon as well uh, Mm. because of that Mm. that upright run style uh, where, you know, he exposes his body a little bit more than you want to see. But, you know, vision, quickness, uh, you know, good size player. So, uh, yeah, Madison, I like that as well. Who's I think my get? sermon comp at the moment is Willis McGahee, actually. Interesting. All right, there you go. Mm-hmm. Uh, former first-round pick there uh, in Willis McGahee. Uh, guys, let's go with a player at the running back spot that we are higher on than most. Now, I'm not going to put any kind of round value on this for you. I just want to go around the horn. Who's a running back that we are higher on than most? Dane, you can go first here. Yeah, I'm going with Khalil Herbert, uh, Virginia Ooh, Tech, nice. who I, I like quite a bit. And, you know, a guy that's – uh, you know, he was kind of lost a little bit at Kansas. He goes to Virginia Tech this past year, and he was outstanding. I mean, his nickname is Juice for a reason. Um, he does a really nice job reading his blocks, maximizing angles, uh, and then just punching the gas where he's going to attack the second and third levels. Um, you know, he's a little bit unproven as a pass catcher, and that that's that's bothersome. Um, but he creates yards for himself uh, with his ability to quickly connect his feet, his eyes, decision making. Um, so I, I would love to see him go to a zone oriented scheme and just, just let him eat. Uh, yeah, he's a guy that I think is, uh, is certainly really intriguing and he's got Ben and I were actually just talking about him off air and I threw a player. We were talking about player comps for, uh, for Trey Sermon earlier. How about Mike Davis, uh, Dane, what do you, what do you think of a Mike Davis comp when he was coming out of South Carolina? And obviously he, he's found some success, success over the last couple of years as well in the NFL. Yeah, no, I like that. A guy that, you know, you don't quite know what you're getting on third down, but yep. as, you know, the quick feet, um, you know, he's, uh, you know, just you, you want him getting going downhill. Um, sometimes he goes too fast, but, you know, you want to get him going downhill because he's got some power. He's got some speed. Yeah, I like that. Uh, so I'm going to go with one of his rivals in the ACC this year and Javante Williams. Dane, you brought him up earlier. Look, I think everybody, Ben, you made the point off air uh, about an hour ago. We were talking about it, and everybody likes Javante Williams. I love Javante Williams. Like, I think he could be a three down starter in the NFL. Um, I like. I think he brings to a lot of traits to the table uh, in terms of his ability to make people miss, his vision, his violence. Uh, you know, he checks all the boxes from a pass game standpoint and catching the football, and also in pass pro. I really, really like uh, Javante Williams. I would say I like him more than most. Uh, ben, who is your third here? I'm going to go with the guy that I thought had a decent week down there at the senior bowl, kind of a uh, unknown and a little bit unheralded prospect. And that's Mm -hmm. captain American himself, Chris Evans out of Michigan, a guy that missed all 2019 with an off the field academic mistake, but you know, uh, did the right thing, worked three jobs, stayed on campus has always been buried on the depth chart behind Davion Smith and Karan Higdon. This guy caught the ball really well. The senior bowl week, not only caught the ball, but got open, ran some dynamic routes. And when you put on his tape, whether it's the, you know, 2017 Ohio State game, 2018 Ohio State game. This guy shows up in big games, plucks the ball away from his frame, runs through arm tackles, picks up his feet and knees. Uh, You know, once he gets in the open field, he's a tough inside runner. Now the caveat, he's 23 years old. He better be ready to go. But I see a Tony, a Sony Michelle or a D'Angelo Williams style of player that I think he's a really nice B plus all round back. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, Evans, uh, I think, helped himself uh, down in Mobile for sure. Let's go to our last one here. A guy that we feel has the ability to rise from now until draft day. No combine, so it's going to be it's going to be a little bit spread out in terms of how these test results uh, come in, and uh, you know, you'll see some buzz start to build. But uh, I'll kick things off here, and then I'll go to Ben, then Dane. To me, it's a name that, you know, if you had said six months ago, eight months ago that we were going to do a running back preview and we haven't mentioned Chuba Hubbard yet from Oklahoma State, I think a lot of people say like, oh, that's, you know, he must have gone back to school. But but Hubbard, uh, one of the more explosive players in the country, he was banged up this year for the Cowboys. But I think when you look at this guy, he's got a big playability. He could do it in the run game and in the pass game. Just get this guy out in space. You know, I compared him in terms of, uh, you know, when he was coming out kind of a lot of very similar to Dalvin cook. And I think who Hubbard has some of those same traits, especially when he's, you know, he is able to just put his foot in the ground and go. Uh, I really like Chuba Hubbard and he would be a guy, I would say he's got the ability to, you know, see his stock, take a, take a big jump here because people, he's kind of out of sight right now. And if he goes to his pro day and runs, you know, low four fours, high four threes, everyone's like, Oh yeah. Like, by the way, Chuba Hubbard, one of the best big play backs in all of college football over the last couple of years. Where is he right now? You think, I mean, is he, 
like he didn't make my top 100. Um, yeah. you know, is he early day three? Like, like I don't know. Cause I, I agree with you. Yeah. Cause he's, he's gonna, he's going to run well. That his yep. acceleration is the key to his success on the football field. So yeah, that, that could certainly happen, but you know, where you think he's probably fourth, fifth round right now. Yeah. I mean, that's, I kind of wonder where he ultimately ends up, but, uh, Look, if if a team takes him late day two, does that shock anybody? Like that doesn't shock me. Like if he goes if he goes you know, no. round three, that doesn't shock me. Uh, right. If he falls to the, to the third day, sure, but it, that would not surprise me uh, if a team said, "Yeah, like this guy could be uh, the game breaker we're looking for out of the backfield." Uh, ben, who's uh, the guy you think will rise? I'm going to go with this running back I just watched this morning. I was watching him and his teammate, but there's two running backs in this class with a thousand receiving yards and a thousand rushing yards in their You're career. Great with these. Yeah. One is Travis Etienne. That's the easy pick. The other one, neither of you guys know it. So I'm going to tell you Otis Anderson at a central yeah. Florida. And he has a teammate, Greg McCray. That's a similar type of uh, height, weight, speed type of back, both very undersized, like 5'10", 175. But Otis Anderson, why do we love Kenneth Gainwell? Why do we love Demetrius Felton? Why do we love Naheem Hines? They're guys with receiver pedigrees, played a lot of time in the slot before their running back duties. That's what Otis Anderson did for a couple of years. Played out in the slot quite a bit, all-purpose back, good runner, receiver, punt returner, catches the ball extremely well. I don't know what to do with him, except I want him in my offensive design, my game plan. He's a dangerous weapon. I don't know if he's a traditional anything, slot, running back, third down back, scat back, but he's an athlete, and I want him in my locker room. So he's a really interesting player uh, when you put on his tape, and I just think he's a little bit behind the eight ball right now, having not gone down to one of the all-star games or you know having a big bowl game you know, uh, season uh, to finish the season. But him and Greg McCray, two really good running backs out of UCF. Yeah, he's it. he's your classic quicker than fast scat back. Like I, I've seen him get cut from behind, but his start stop, his ability to force missed tackles is is silly at times. So that's that's a good name. Uh, Dane, wrap us up. Wrap us up here. Who's uh, who's yours? I'm gonna go with Javian Hawkins uh, from nice. Louisville. Yep. Uh, I mean, his nickname is PlayStation. You know, because of his elusiveness. <laughs> uh, he's got that slippery feet. He can bounce laterally, slash away from trouble. Uh, it reminds me of a, a more dynamic version of Donald Pumphrey. So does not have great size, um, does not run with power. Uh, he's more of a clear point of entry type of back, but speed, shifty feet, you know, he can stack cuts on cuts and on cuts. And, and that's, that's, I think that's going to show in the testing. And so um, for the right team, that's looking for that change of pace guy, that, that, that athlete that can create with the ball in his hands you know, I, I think that that could be JVN Hawkins. He, he had three runs of over 70 yards this year. Like he, he has the juice to be a big play threat. And so that'll appeal to certain teams. Where are you pulling all these nicknames from, Dane? He had juice, he had PlayStation, you got a nickname guy? Yeah, no, hey, if, uh, if they got the nickname, I'm going to find it. Uh, it <laughs> I think it, it, it reveals a lot. You know Ben's nickname from when he was, uh, from when he played up at, uh, up in high school? Well, what was it? Ben? Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see if we got any more nicknames here with our final three players. We're going to go uh, on the clock here and pick three players, three teams, three positions, three different areas of the draft. Let's get going. On the clock. All right, guys. So this segment was met with uh, plenty of fanfare last week, and we're going to keep it going here. We're going to pick three random teams uh, with three positions and three parts of the draft. Dane, uh, you will kick us off here, and yours is going to be outside corner. So not a slot guy, but an outside cornerback for the Atlanta Falcons in round one. So we're going with a top five pick here uh, to kick us off. And really, there's there's two options. Uh, I'm interested to see where you ultimately go here for the Atlanta Falcons. Yeah, interesting because they went outside corner in last year's draft with Correct. AJ uh, Terrell. Uh, you know, could they do it again? Sure. Yeah, yeah. form the uh, you know a lockdown duo. That'd be a lot of fun. So with the fourth pick, yeah, like you mentioned, they have a choice of going two ways here. Um, let's say Patrick Sertan is the is the way they go. They a, a guy that doesn't have uh, elite speed or twitch, but. He's coordinated. He's quick. He's instinctive. He just knows how to play the position. Um, you know, if you go to uh, you know Nick Saban's program and start as a freshman, you, you you know what you're doing, and that stems from you know growing up as the son of a Pro Bowler. Just I I don't know how high his ceiling is. That's kind of the question that I have with with uh, Sertan, but I do know that he has a very high floor. And so with the fourth pick, I, I think that would make some sense. 
and with Dean Pease now in there as the defensive coordinator, I'm expecting a little bit more true man to man than getting out of the true Dan Quinn single high cover three stuff. Hmm, that's a good point too. Uh, I like it. But let's go to uh, our second one here. And uh, Ben, uh, you could take the honors here with this one. You have a Sam linebacker, so tough position to, to project for a strong side okay. linebacker for the Houston Texans. Another new coaching staff, late day. Three. So we're talking about a late round pick at Sam linebacker for the Houston Texans and their new defensive coordinator, uh, Lovey Smith. That's interesting with Lovey Smith in there, but traditionally they actually get a lot of play out of that Sam linebacker, which is one of the more dying positions around the NFL. It's normally the one that comes off the field to replace with the sub package nickel, but you know, they're, they like the thick outside linebacker, almost that defensive end hybrid, good run defenders, tough point of attack players, not really the skinny twitchy types. So, you know, they have Whitney Merciless there. It's kind of that Sam Joker player, but then they have Brennan Scarlett, Jacob Martin, Kyle Emanuel, all kind of a certain profile. So as much as I'm looking at a Malcolm Kuntz at a Buffalo or Hamilcar Rashida at Oregon state, I just think they're more of the twitched up skinny kinds that really don't fit that style. Yep. So I'm looking at two here that were really uh, nice players down at the senior bowl. We're going to go with Derek Barnes out of Purdue who is about 6'1", 250, another guy that's played some Sam, played some Mike. I don't know what I want to do with him at the next level yet, but he's a strong, tough player. The other one is William Bradley King out of Baylor, who I I compared to Nuchena Nuoso coming out of the uh, USC and now with the Los Los Angeles Chargers. He's 6'3", 255. I don't know if either of you guys have a feel or a fit for either of those two Barnes or Bradley King, but I'm probably going to lean with Derek Barnes a little bit more. I think he's a little bit more versatile playing, you know, off ball and Sam linebacker, a little bit more athletic, but William Bradley King's played a lot more on the line of scrimmage and probably a little bit better of a true pass rusher. But both of those, I think are the mold I'm, I'm looking at here. Would you guys agree? I think I would have gone Barnes too. I think that yeah. would have been my, my selection as well, Dane. Yeah. I like that. Uh, size and speed that's what he offers and you know he did a little bit of an as an edge rusher uh play off the ball so i think that fits at the end of the day these aren't finesse players i think they're strong point of attack players good run defenders and let's see if they have any juice and space or to get after the passer right no that's a good point uh so for mine here i'm gonna go uh left tackle las vegas raiders round three so right into the meat of the draft and, you know, you guys know me. I'm trying to connect dots, right? So uh, I look at the key decision maker here. Obviously, you have John Gruden there, but also Mike Mayock. And since Mike has taken over in, in Vegas, what do we see in terms of his draft strategy? He's going for tough, blue-collar, hard-nosed guys who, who love football. Uh, they don't care as much, it doesn't seem, about the height, weight, speed element. I feel like intangibles kind of outweigh the tangibles when it comes to the Raiders and how they've drafted guys. We've seen that time and time and time again, right? They took Cleveland Farrell, number four overall, not because he was this explosive, twitchy pass rusher, but because he could be that kind of alpha dog in that locker room. And then you look at Tom Cable, right? So you look at Tom Cable, uh, the offensive line coach, what are the type of linemen uh, that he has worked with in the past? And I think when you look, uh, you know, at this group, uh, there are. I'm looking at left tackle, and I'm like, all right, like who are the names that kind of make the most sense here and check boxes for both Tom Cable and for Mike Mayock? And I ended up settling in on Walker Little from Stanford, who is a little bit of a wild card in this draft, uh, just because we've seen very, very little uh, of him. But I think when you look at um, you know his overall skill set, he's a little bit of a developmental player. And Tom Cable has you know t- t- trended more towards some of those developmental guys. He's got the size that I think Tom Cable temp- typically trends towards. He checks boxes off the field that uh, I think Mike Mayock uh, will will like as well. Mike's got a little bit of a relationship with David Shaw. I think you look at you start checking a lot of boxes there, and I think Walker Little makes some sense there for round three for uh, the Las Vegas Raiders. I don't know if you guys uh, like that pick or if you would have gone a different route. I, I like it. Um, you know, I, I just it brings up an interesting discussion that we don't have to dive too much into, but just how teams are going to look at these opt out guys. Yeah, you know, like it, it, you mentioned how you know Mayock and Gruden, old school guys, like how are they going to view opt out players? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I just, it's going to be different from team to team and, and in, uh, on an individual basis, how they're going to view each situation. And, you know, when they ask these guys during the interview process, well, you know, why'd you abandon your team? Why'd you opt out? And the answers may, maybe not going to be what they want to hear sometimes, or, you know, it just might not be a good enough answer. So I, it, it's going to be really interesting. Um, just kind of separate from just Walker, a little situation, but all these opt outs, 
but especially for Walker Little, who we didn't see, who played one game in 2019 uh, and had the ACL. So, you know, we just haven't seen a lot of him. He could have benefited a lot by playing this year. Uh, yeah. So it's just a, it's a really interesting dynamic for this, this draft cycle. And just really quick about the opt-outs, I promise every player – has their own story, their own reason, their own path to opting out. You cannot group all the opt-outs together. And I think it's really important to differentiate. And for a little bit, I was clumping them all together and saying, why did so-and-so opt out when he did? And I promise everybody has their own story. And just for an example, I was watching an SEC safety opted out in November, wondering why he opted out. He's a son with a genetic abnormality, needs a bone marrow transplant. He has things going on in his personal life that are going to accelerate his desire to become a professional. And everybody's going to have their own story, their own path, their own reasoning. So yep. just a little bit of a buyer beware to not group all these players together. No, I think that's a good point. Uh, we've, in this segment, played matchmaker for three different teams. And we're going to do something similar in our next segment. We're going to go to the blueprint. Arif Hassan from The Athletic, uh, who covers the Minnesota Vikings, going to give us a little bit of insight into how Minnesota approaches the draft. Let's get to that segment right now with the blueprint. All right, well, joining us here this week for the Blueprint is Arif Hassan. You can follow him on Twitter just like I do, at Arif Hassan NFL. You can follow his work over at The Athletic where he covers the Minnesota Vikings. Arif, thanks for joining me, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. So let's get into the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, you know, Rick Spielman, the general manager, uh, has been there, I believe, since 2006. Is that right? When he first joined as VP of Player Personnel and was promoted to GM uh, in 2012. I think I've got that timeline right. Uh, has been there for a long time. And, and so this yeah, is a team... Yeah. Uh, that has an identity. And so uh, I guess you, I know that you follow this team extremely closely. We'll do this the way we have done over the last few weeks where we'll kind of paint three different trends and we'll go one at a time here, uh, you know, looking at Minnesota and their draft history under Spielman. Uh, what would be the first one that you would bring up to those that uh, are putting together mock drafts? Yeah, I think one that uh, is worth noting, I wouldn't necessarily say that this one is kind of locked and loaded, um, is that now that I'm seeing the Vikings getting mocked defensive linemen all the time, I just kind of want to put this out there, um, that the Vikings have not drafted an edge rusher in the first two rounds since Spielman arrived, or even a little bit before wow. then. Uh, and so, you know, Everson Griffin, uh, fourth rounder, Brian Robinson, fourth rounder, uh, Daniil Hunter, third rounder, um, you know, everybody that they've drafted on the edge has been a third rounder or later. And then in the Zimmer era, uh, defensive tackle, you know, they haven't drafted um, at all in the first round or first two rounds. Um, and so, you know, the the before that, it was 2013 with Shreve Floyd. So that's something to keep in mind. I'm not saying, you know, don't mock Quiddy Pay or Gregory Rousseau or whoever um, to the Vikings. I'm just saying, you know, that's something to keep in mind. Maybe if there's a tie you want to break, that's a good way to put it. Mm. I think that's a, a great point. It was something I had that had not occurred to me because I feel like that has been kind of the slam dunk, like everybody right. putting Greg Rousseau or Quiddy Pay or Ojolari, any of those guys uh, to the Vikings. That's almost like an automatic in every mock draft that I see. Uh, what would be the second one? Yeah, well, I, I think that generally speaking, and, and obviously every team kind of wants to say this, but I think it's held true for the Vikings when you compare them to their peers, is that they um, always kind of draft with some kind of analytical edge of some sort, yep. whether it's production or athleticism. Uh, and, and there needs to be something there from an analytical perspective for them to take a to take a the dive. And I think in the early rounds, we see that a lot, in particular with athleticism. So they're faster. A lot of these guys that they draft, especially um, at skill positions, are faster than you'd expect for somebody if they're weighted their position across the 40. In fact, a couple years ago, I charted it and nearly everybody's 40 time that they drafted uh, at some point, either at their pro day or their combine was faster than their peers of, of, of players at the same position and similar weights. So that's something to keep in mind. If you've got a guy that you think is a good fit for the Vikings and is a little bit slower, um, especially you expect them to, to post a, a fairly poor 40 time. I, I'd maybe double check that again. Um, you know, it, it kind of depends on your interpretation, which 40 time they sure. drafted Cameron Dancer in the third round and his 40 time at the combine was poor obviously at the pro day it was great self-reported who knows right. uh, but that's, that's something to keep in mind as well i love that all right well let's get to uh let's get to the third one because uh, the, the first two have been lights out so far yeah, I, I think um, you take a look at, you know, uh, there's been a lot of defensive drafting for the Vikings. I think that makes a lot of sense. The defense struggled. One thing also to keep in mind is that aside from nose tackle, they're a little bit smaller up front and bigger in the secondary. So mm. um, you tend to go six feet or higher for cornerbacks. They did draft a couple of five, 10 guys recently with players like, you know, Jeff Gladney and Mike Hughes. So, and, and those guys are extraordinarily physical players. So that's right. something to keep in mind. But they really love the six feet, six two guys with like, you know, 31, 32 
inch arms in the secondary. Um, and up front, you know, they, they, they've been drafting a lot of people who convert from defensive end to defensive tackles, so a lot of 280 pounders to play defensive tackle. And then for edge rushers, a lot of 250 pounders, not the 260, 270 guys they used to see a ton. So undersized up front, they like, again, they like that speed a lot. And then, uh, Zimmer really likes length in the secondary. Again, um, if it's a guy that he expects to play on the outside, that's a little bit more important than a guy he expects to play in the slot. I love that. That's uh, that one in particular. I, just looking at it, and that's what's fun about following the teams that you know the coach has been in place for a handful of years, the general manager has been in place for a handful of years. You start to get a real good sense of the the prototypes that they're looking for from a body type standpoint, from an athleticism standpoint. Uh, you were able to cover the whole gamut there um, from you know all angles of that. Uh, that being said, are there some schools that uh, you know when you look at Rick Spielman and this coaching staff, you know they seem to just have a special connection with, or you feel that just kind of important ones to take into account when people are putting together their mock drafts this spring? Yeah, every time it feels like there's a pattern with schools, they break it. <laughs> so uh, they didn't draft an LSU player between uh, 2005 and 2015 at all. And then they drafted Daniel Hunter and Justin Jefferson, right? right. Um, they drafted three Notre Dame players in 2011 and 2012. Uh, and then they haven't drafted one again since then. Um, they undraft, I guess, a little bit from high-powered schools, your Alabama, Ohio State, LSU's Clemson's. Um, well, not, not Clemson as much, but generally speaking, I guess they draft a little bit less from those schools that you expect to compete hmm. um, for a national championship or coming off of national championship teams. But it's not huge. Again, if there's a tiebreaker, uh, probably go for a, a power five school that's a somewhat mid-tier. Um, but, you know, they don't overdraft small schools. They don't overdraft, uh, you know, the big schools. Um, they kind of let the Bears take care of the small schoolers in the division. Uh, <laughs> no and, question. Uh, they, are, they are like far and away. Like yeah. they're always dipping in the small school for sure yeah so but they don't they don't avoid small schools either right uh, that's something to keep in mind sure Uh, what when you look at this team and you look at this roster uh big picture right now what do you view as the three biggest needs for this team going into this draft i think mock drafters have kind of nailed it they're drafting defensive linemen um for the vikings you know first and foremost so that's something you know again you know I'm, i'm a little hesitant to draft uh you know defensive linemen in the first round but again they've usually had really good defensive linemen so you could wait you know, right. it was justifiable the past 10 years to, to wait a little bit. So maybe that's a reason. But yeah, defensive linemen, biggest need. I mean, they got the worst pressure rate in the NFL, according to, I think, Sport Radar and PFF, multiple charting companies. Um, obviously, getting Daniel Hunter back is going to be big. Getting Michael Pierce back is going to be big. But um, they, they want to give Hunter some help, which is why they traded for Ngakwe in the first place. So um, that that is something I would pay attention to. If you're not grabbing someone at least by round three, um, then, then you're probably making a mistake somewhere. Hmm. Interesting. And then what would be uh, the the second or third need that you, know, you would look at? Yeah, I mean anybody. <laughs> Honestly, you can <laughs> uh, you can you can justify I think any position. Sure. Um, the one Vikings fans have been talking about the most is uh, along the offensive line. Okay. Um, for me, that's a little rich. But the Vikings have been drafting interior linemen earlier and earlier. Now they used to not draft interior linemen at all uh, in the first couple of rounds. Now we've seen them draft um, uh, Pat Elfline in the third round, uh, yeah. Garrett Bradbury in the first round. Uh, so you know, and and Ezra Cleveland, you know, I think they drafted him to play tackle, but they kicked him to guard this year. So mm. um, you can say that they drafted an interior lineman in the second round there as well. But yeah, you can justify an offensive lineman very easily. It's been a constant uh, you know, source of concern for the team. Um, so if I had to pick a number two, I think it'd be offensive lineman. All right. So uh, would there be a third or you feel like just kind of the, the whole pool, everything's on the table? I, I I would I would say the whole pool everything's on yep. the table again. If I'm forced to pick, I'd say a defensive back of some sort. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, if, if if there is you know someone that can play safety nickel, kind of like Antoine Winfield last year, um, uh, or or even like a, a Tanner Muse that can play multiple positions or something. Right. Um, you know, that's something that I would keep in mind because I, I think that third cornerback position hasn't been figured out. They've got a safety hitting free agency, and Harrison Smith is getting a little bit older too. So, you know, there's there's some you know capability to select a defensive back of some sort. And again, a, a safety nickel hybrid would be, you know, nice, but, you know, I, I wouldn't, you know, go out of my way to try and force that fit either. Sure. All right. So the reason why I ask about the needs is that everyone always talks about need versus best player available. How do you look at that when you look at Spielman and his history, Zimmer and his history, uh, when looking at the Vikings here for this upcoming draft? 
Uh, they seem to be a pretty need-based drafting organization in the first couple rounds or even kind of throughout the draft. Um, they they do have tendencies like in the fifth, sixth round. Uh, they're always drafting some kind of off-ball linebacker, usually for special teams. So that's not always a need, but they always grab that guy. Um, they're always grabbing um, a special teams corner or safety of some sort uh, in the late rounds. So, you know, that's something to keep in mind if you're doing like full seven-round mock drafts or something along those lines. But early on, they, they do really seem to focus on need. And sometimes that need isn't ready readily apparent when they drafted Shreve Floyd, they still have Kevin Williams on the roster, but they knew he was going to go. Uh, when they drafted Mike Hughes, they anticipated the the contract situation for the cornerbacks with all three hitting free agency at the same time. They expected Mike Hughes to be ready this year. Um, so th- there's always a need in mind when they draft in the first couple of rounds. Um, so that's something that they do. And I, I think that's the appropriate strategy. I'm not a huge BPA guy because, right. you know, if your guy can't see the field because the guy ahead of him is, is good enough, then he's not the best player available because he's not available to you. So so, uh, I mean, that's that's always hmm. been my approach, right? So, um, given the wide expanse of needs, like I mentioned, for the Vikings this year, it's pretty easy to conflate um, the two. And and you can honestly justify almost uh, – the, the next article I'm writing is how you can justify basically any position in the first round for the Vikings. I mean, like, they're set at tight end even if they trade away a Kyle Rudolph or cut him or something like that. And I would still be okay with them drafting like Kyle Pitts, right? Like, that makes sense. Sure. Well, th- with that being said – uh, is there a player that is being mocked to the Vikings right now? You know, obviously they're all over the place, but is there a, a guy that you're seeing that uh, really just kind of makes a ton of sense with all the information that you've laid out so far in this segment? Yeah, well, if Quidi- Pay falls, you know, despite that um, kind of tendency that I identified, I, I, it'd be hard for me to see them decide no on this guy. Um, he fits a lot of what they, they like, you know, from a profile perspective, the, the, I guess not even rumored, but, you know, stopwatch timed, yeah. uh, you know, three cone that we saw, um, that's gotta be pretty appealing. Cause they usually like them to either have a super fast three cone or a remarkable explosion score of some sort. That's something to keep in mind. I think the Rashawn Slater pick that I've seen a lot makes a ton of sense, you know, because he can play both tackle and guard, I think from what a lot of people are saying, but certainly he has the athleticism to fit the zone running profile that they like. Um, so I think that makes sense. The, the one thing that, that doesn't, I guess, make a ton of sense, cause you know, I've seen the USC guard, I've seen the Ohio state guard. I think they make a ton of sense, uh, is, is, um, Micah Parsons, obviously, you know, the, the stuff that came out, um, you know, he hasn't been, I think, mocked in the first round very much, you know, in the past month for, for a couple of pretty good reasons. But even without that, um, you'd have to resolve the Anthony Barr question, right. you know, at some point, you know, whether or not he's going to be on the roster, especially at his contract number. So yeah. that's something I don't, you know, they, they, they like linebackers in the first round a little bit more than some teams, but they're pretty much set there unless they make a move. That's why, honestly, like you mentioned Quiddy Pay, when you went through your three bullets at the top of this segment, you talked about, uh, you know, analytical stuff, you know, the analytical edge, and then also the uh, those D-tackle, D-E hybrids. Like, I almost th- thought my brain immediately went to Pay because I feel like he's a guy that can give you that juice from the interior. He can line up outside as well, obviously, but uh, kind of has that kind of body type. And uh, when you look at it from an analytical edge, I think that, that kind of makes sense. So I, I was glad you kind of brought his name up. Yeah, I, I think he makes a ton of sense. I mean, I don't think you have to hit every single bullet point for the Vikings trends because they always find a trend to break, you know, this right. year, the next year, the next year after that. Um, so at some point, you know, you know, these rules aren't going to be rules or just going to be suggestions. And I think this would be a good time to to break the trend of, of drafting edge rushers a little bit later. I think that he would be um, a really great fit for what the Vikings tend to look for at the position. So just any final parting advice for anybody that's uh, making a mock draft and is picking for the Vikings, any kind of parting words for those people? I, I think they could pick almost anybody. They just they just have to um they just have to make sure that, you know, hey, if it's an offensive lineman, he's athletic enough to fit the scheme. Hey, if right. it's a defensive lineman, he has to be able to push up field. Um, you know, that sort of stuff. Just, you know, kind of base level, hey, this is kind of what they're doing schematically. Um, but you know, the Vikings are looking for some diversity in their secondary, so you can justify a lot of picks there as long as they've got baseline athleticism. Um, they're looking for pressure production up front, you know, they're they're set at nose tackle, so getting a run stuffer doesn't make a ton of sense. Um, but yeah, I, I think that, you know, unless you pick a running back, you're you probably got a pretty good reason <laughs> to to pick whoever you're picking. So uh, you know, kind of, you know, all's fair this year for them. Sure. Well, Arif, this has been awesome, man. Thanks so much for uh, providing some insight into the way that the Minnesota Vikings approach the NFL draft. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll talk to you soon. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Now it's time to hear from you, the fans, in the draft mailbag. 
I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation with Arif, and that was some great information, stuff that I will definitely be taking with me moving forward throughout the rest, uh, not just of this pre-draft process, but really uh, moving forward because uh, Rick Spielman, Mike Zimmer, uh, they are here to uh, to stay in Minnesota, at least for the foreseeable future. Let's get to a couple comments from you guys at home in our draft mailbag. And first one comes from Bear Cub Fan, who just left a five-star review saying that they love the podcast. So Bear Cub Fan, appreciate that. Uh, appreciate the kind words. Let's go to our first question here. Scrambles Magoo left a five-star review saying, year after year, the Eagles seem to draft players nowhere close to the national consensus of talent. McShay and Kuyper's top players available are never the players that we select. I know the talent evaluation is subjective, but it seems like we end up hurting ourselves trying to find the diamond in the rough instead of taking the gem already in the jewelry store praying for SEC players. So uh, Scrambles, look, I think when it comes to this, you mentioned it, obviously that talent evaluation is subjective. And if t- if it was as easy as just following Kuiper's big board, uh, there would be, the teams would have a lot easier process uh, going through the NFL draft. It is not always uh, that easy. And that being said, I think when you look at the draft and you look at player selection, we have to remember the kind of work that goes into that because it's not just one person's opinion, right? The, the general manager, and in this case, you're referring to the Eagles and, and Howie Roseman, right? The, that, that decision maker, they're not just in the ivory tower. I'm speaking about all 32 teams. They're not just completely siloed uh, on one side and everybody else doing all this work. Uh, yeah, they're over on the other side of the building. This is all one big fluid discussion. And every team handles that a little bit differently, right? Obviously, uh, in some buildings, you know, coaches have more sway, scouts have more sway, specific personnel men have more say. But overall, it is going to be a collaborative process. Everybody's going to be on, not everybody's going to be on board with every single pick, but it's going to be a group decision. So while there's going to be conflicting opinions in every single draft room with every single decision, those are conversations that are had leading up to the entire thing. And there are so many factors that come into play. You know, when you talk about a player, you know, the one player that always gets brought up is a guy like DK Metcalf, right? Well, look, DK Metcalf was a player, me personally, yeah, the, the film, and we talked about this on the show. Every single week, it felt, leading up to that draft in 2019, DK Metcalf was a beast in the SEC, right? At Ole Miss, I mean, big play after big play after big play. But that being said, he there were a lot of questions in terms of uh, you know the, the route tree and things like that. And that's a separate deal. But then when you throw in the medical... That's going. I mean, that that's the reason why he fell to the end of round two. The Eagles weren't the only team that passed on a DK Metcalf. A lot of teams had questions about him. Seattle passed on him a couple of times in that draft, right? If they knew what they were getting, he probably would have been selected much earlier by the Seattle Seahawks. I, I think when you look at, at these players and at these selections, you have to remember that there are so many things, so many factors that go into it. It's not just as easy as, oh, well, this is, this is the guy that's at the top of the list. This is who everybody thinks we should take. Let's take that guy. There are some teams where it feels like they work that way. And guess what? It doesn't always work or it doesn't always work out. If you're going just off, you know, whether it's a, a Kuiper or a McShay or uh, a Daniel Jeremiah, you know, a Dane Brugler, a, a Fran Duffy, insert whoever, it's not going to work out because everybody is going to have those misses. And guess what? NFL teams, they get more information than anybody in the media. I promise you, you would be shocked at how much information, the depth of the information that teams get on these players. Doesn't mean that they're going to be perfect. Obviously, they're not. You're never going to be perfect when it comes to the NFL draft, and that's why a lot of people will say that it's a crapshoot, but it's all about trying to get as much information as possible and then trying to make the best decision based off that information to help your team moving forward. And That's going to change by the team, by the coaching scheme, by the fit, who are the players that are already in the depth chart, who's the position coach, all of those things all come into play. There there are a lot of factors. And so uh, me personally, that's one of the things that I love most about it, right? We always talk about trying to connect the dots. Who are the, the players that make sense for this this team or that team? And it's not just as easy. Oh, well, you know, the, the New York Giants need a pass rusher. So put the, the top pass rusher on the board. That's not that's that it doesn't work that way. It's the reason why, honestly, I wanted to come up with a segment like the blueprint, right? Talk about Arif Hassan. You know, we had we talked about who are those pass rushers in that last segment that make sense. A couple of them make sense. Maybe that means that uh, you know a Greg Rousseau doesn't make as much sense as an Aziz Ojolari. I'm just inserting names here, but that that's the kind of conversations that have that we have. And even in the on the clock segment, I think you know we're gonna do that in that template here these next couple of weeks. But I think once we get into March and April. I think we might even twist that one a little bit and give you a sense of kind of the conversations that happen in draft rooms when you have coaches and scouts and the executives, everybody weighing in on it. 
it's going to be a really int- it's an interesting look uh, into the conversation. It's a, a layered, layered discussion. Scrambles, really, really appreciate the question. It's a good one, and obviously one that's on the forefront of everybody's minds, especially this time of year. Hope I was able to answer uh, that question to your satisfaction. That being said, let's wrap this show up. We had a lot here covered in today's episode. We've got more coming later this week right here on the Journey to the Draft podcast driven by AAA. In just over three years, Eagles Autism Foundation has raised millions of dollars for autism research and care. But this is about so much more than just fundraising. This is about making a transformational difference in the lives of those affected by autism. This is about bringing our community together. With inclusive, sensory-friendly events and accessible resources, we meet families where they need us most and where we can serve them best. Together, we're united in our mission to improve the lives of the autism community and to turn awareness into action. It's what we focus on every day in every way.